I know this is a very different look for a service from the Family Prayer Center, but we're entering into a wonderful new season and uh, things are gonna change for the better. It's gonna be great. Uh, temporarily, we're going to be doing our services uh, sometimes here at home, uh, sometimes in a other building, but uh, we're looking forward with great anticipation to what the Lord is doing and he's getting us revival ready in every way. So there'll be more information about that coming. But for today, I want to continue our lesson talking about we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And I hope you've been keeping up with the teachings that we've been doing for the last several weeks, uh, how the Lord expanded my understanding finally after 40 years of Mark chapter 4. I always quit meditating Mark chapter 4 at the end of Mark chapter 4. And come to find out, really, you don't find out the fruit that he's talking about until you get into Mark chapter 5 and verse 20. So if you want to meditate Mark chapter 4, please be sure and go ahead through Mark chapter 5 and verse 20. Because Jesus illustrates the teaching. We, we've all heard so many messages about the sower sows the word. You've probably heard a hundred or more messages on it, just like I have. You could probably teach it as well as me. But really it, the illustration of everything that he taught comes right at the end of the chapter he he gives them a word he sows the word to them let us cross over to the other side he doesn't tell them why but they receive the word with gladness just like in the parable that he taught and they start out to the other side and immediately a great storm arises well what did he say was going to happen he said satan comes immediately to remove the word out of your heart Sometimes if you don't understand it, that's one way he removes it. But all of those other methods that he talked about, uh, persecutions, afflictions, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, uh, the lusts of other things entering in, all of those things are methods that the enemy uses to choke the word and make it unfruitful. And even that used to really choke the word and make it unfruitful. How do you do that? The word is God. You can't... <laughs> I, Something in me would rise up. You can't choke the word and make it unfruitful. Well, you've got to continue on to Matthew, I mean Mark chapter 5 and verse 20 to understand what he's talking about. So again, he sows the word to them. Let us cross over to the other side. I have learned through experience, sometimes he tells you why, sometimes he doesn't. In this case, he didn't. So they set out to obey him. They received the word with gladness, just like most of us do, and they set out to obey the Lord. And then this great storm comes. And, well, that's what he predicted. He said Satan comes immediately to, to steal the word. In this case, it's a storm. Now, all of those things that we mentioned earlier, persecution, affliction, cares of this world, and so forth, all of them are intended to divert you away from your word. These guys, they worked hard trying to keep the boat afloat. They're trying to do what Jesus said. But... The storm accomplished its goal because what happened, their attention was diverted from going to the other side to survival. <laughs> if you've ever been through some real storms of life, oftentimes that's what happens because notice when they come to wake Jesus up, I mean, he wasn't all upset. He's asleep in the boat there. And they come and wake him up. Notice what they do not say. They do not say, Lord, we're having trouble getting to the other side. <laughs> Getting to the other side is not an issue now. They're going, don't you care that we're about to die? Don't you care that we perish? What has happened? Well, the storm has accomplished its purpose. It has diverted their attention from the word that was sown into them to survival now. And one way or another, all of those things mentioned earlier that Jesus taught, all of them are to divert your attention away from what the word, whatever it is Jesus has called you to do, your place in the kingdom, it's to divert you so that it, it never happens. See, now, how do you choke the word and it becomes unfruitful? Well, to understand that, you've got to go on to Mark chapter 5 down through verse 20 because there you see the fruit. Once they did get to the other side, what are they met with immediately? Well, it's the madman of Gadara. Boy, this guy is beyond all human help. This guy is beyond your counseling program. 
is beyond your 12-step self-help program. It, and we're not against those things. There's a place for those. But I'm telling you, there's times when people are beyond all human help. They're beyond reasoning. Jesus didn't even try and talk with the man. He said he immediately began speaking to that devil, come out of him. He didn't even try and reason with the man. This man is beyond that. He needed the supernatural deliverance of the Savior, Jesus Christ himself. Sorry, I'm about to, about to preach myself happy because that's the treasure in our earthen vessel. This whole illustration of them going to the other side, they have the treasure in a wooden vessel. That's That Holy Spirit is illustrating the best he can before the new birth what we're the earthen vessel that carries the treasure. And our earthen vessel, we all know, can be broken. It's fragile. It's mortal. It's subject to death. Uh, that's the vessel that we carry the treasure in. Well, the treasure is Christ himself. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the treasure. And our job is to be the earthen vessel that delivers the treasure wherever we are instructed to go. And see, that, that brings up the verse, one of the verses I want to talk about today that we're, we're going to go a little farther on, but I'm just going to mention it for now. See, Jesus says in John 15, verse 14, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Well, what if he says go to the other side? Well, you go to the other side. What if he says give your money to that guy? You give your money to that guy. What if he says this? What if he says that? Well, if we love him, we're going to do what he says. And he says in verse 15, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. But now this one here, look at this. You have not chosen, verse 16, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever you shall ask of the father in my name he may give it to you now this fruit that he's talking about see I, there's the fruit of the spirit which you can read about in galatians chapter 5 i didn't look it up for you you can look it up and it's love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, temperance, meekness, faith. I may have, I hope I got them all close. Well, that's the fruit of the new nature. That's that's Christ in us. That's that's his nature. That's the Holy Spirit. That's his nature, really. It's God's nature. And all of that, of course, is to grow in us and remain. We're not supposed to go backwards from any of it. We're to, supposed to progress into more and more of it all the time. But see, I'm thinking the fruit that he's talking about here is external fruit. More like what he says if we back up to John chapter 14 and verse 12 when he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Well, he's talking about the kind of works <laughs> that he does. I want to remind you a little bit of some lessons we did quite a while earlier because, you know, somebody might be, would have watched Jesus at the time cast out devils and heal the sick and cause the blind to see and all of those things. And they'd say, Jesus, can, do you have a school somewhere? I want to enroll in your school. I, I hear that you take disciples. I want to become a disciple and enroll in your school because I want to be able to do what you do. So, okay, Jesus says, here, you, you can enroll in my school. You can become a disciple. Sit down. Here's the first day of class. And here's the first thing you need to know. It's not me doing those things. <laughs> and, oh, and, and you go, I just saw you. I, I watched you open the eyes of the blind. I watched you pray for a guy that had no leg. And the leg grew. I saw you with my own eyes. What do you mean it's not you? And just like in, in John 14, you can just back up. He says, uh, verse 10 he says believest thou not that I am in the father and the father in me the words that I speak unto you I speak not of myself but the father that dwells in me he doeth the works and he would say the same thing to any disciple you've got to understand it's not you doing the works Christ says, with, uh, he says without me you can do nothing but see it's Christ in us and the father in him and if you want to know the truth of it, that's the Holy Spirit. 
The Spirit, the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of the Father, and He dwells in us. It's the Father in us. He's doing the works. Now, we attribute it all to Christ because, really, it's Christ in us and the Father in Him. You got that? So, again, it's a matter of learning how to let God be God. That Remember our, our foundation verse, we have this treasure in earth and vessels? Why? That the excellency of the power be of God and not of us. We're the vessel. We're like the wooden boat. We're like the disciples in the wooden boat. Their job is to deliver the treasure to the other side. Now notice when they, once they've done that, we don't see them doing anything else. They're like standing on the side watching them. They're watching the power. They're watching Christ that they delivered in their vessel. They're watching him do the work. Well, I've got a lot of, we've got a lot of good teaching on that coming up, so stay tuned. Don't know if we'll get to it today or not, but we got some good ones coming. Uh, previews of coming attractions, as they say. Okay, getting back to today's lesson. Though. Now, once Jesus gets to the other side, see, the fruit is not getting to the other side. That's accomplishing the, the mission for the disciples. That's not the fruit. What is the fruit? It's the madman of Gadara being set free. That's the fruit. Why did Jesus go to the other side? Well, it's because the Father sent him, but why did the Father send him? You could say it this way. Jesus has left the safety of the 99 because there is one lost sheep really in bad shape beyond all human help crying out in the tombs. And we're not told what he was crying out, but either he or someone praying for him was crying out for his deliverance. And bless God, deliverance came. Now, see, that's the fruit. That's what the whole thing was about. It's always about saving the lost, healing the sick, casting out devils. It's always about people. That, that's what this whole gospel is about, is rescuing people for God so loved the world. And he's, he's in the business of saving and healing and delivering, baptizing with the Holy Ghost, making disciples. It's, 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 it's a wonderful life. You know, it's not like the, uh, the old movie title, but it is. It's a wonderful, wonderful life. Now, the fruit of that mission, again, was a man set free, a man who was beyond all human help, a man who was beyond, for sure, any kind of self-help. He had to have the supernatural help of God. Well, listen, that's the calling of the prayer center from the very beginning. It's, Dave is smart. Tim is smart. If, they, if their goal was to build a big church and have a fancy building and all of the things like that, and we're not against any of those things, but it, if, they, if that would have been the goal, they're smart guys. They know how to do that. But that was never the goal. If you want to know the truth of it, John 14, 12 is the goal. And the Lord told Dave all those years ago, gather a group of people, go far enough into God to bring a supernatural revival to a religious city that will spread around the world. See, and you got hooked by that. Why are you still listening here? Why are you still attached to this? God put a hook in your jaw you and that vision, when the first time you ever heard it, that, that calling, that, that assignment, it grabbed you. It hooked you. It was like it did me. And we're not going to quit until we see exactly that. We're not interested in building a big church, a fancy church, a big building, anything like that. We're interested in casting out devils, healing the sick, seeing the lost saved, uh, the supernatural works being done just exactly like Jesus said they should be done. And, and, that, and that, in other words, to bear fruit, the same kind of fruit as the madman of Gadara. And really, if you want to know the truth of it, in Mark chapter 5, there's three examples. I think this was last week's lesson. But three examples of bearing impossible fruit. Not only was it the madman of Gadara, see? And he, by the way, he was famous. Everybody in that region knew about him. He was famous. When that guy got set free, that's why Jesus wouldn't allow him to go with him. He, the madman, who was now sane, he wanted to go with Jesus. But see, Jesus sent him back into that region. Why? Well, this guy's famous. And if he goes around telling what great things the Lord has done for him, how it was Jesus that set him free, 
He's almost on a John the Baptist type mission preparing that whole region to be saved when they, when they hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's, it's a wonderful thing. I saw a similar thing in South Africa. Uh, the biggest criminal in that region got saved in prison. And boy, he became a tremendous evangelist. He was the he was the criminals that the criminals feared. He was the one that would rob other gangsters. <laughs> and to, in their mind, if he can get saved, Jesus is real. And many people came to the Lord because of his testimony. I believe the same thing happened uh, uh, because of the madman of Gadara who was no longer mad and been set free. But see, there's an example of fruit. Okay, two more impossible fruits in that same chapter, Mark chapter 5. There was a woman with the issue of blood. She'd already spent all of her money on all of these doctors, on all of these years, and she wasn't better. She was worse. Now, she's at the end. She doesn't have any more money. Uh, doctors apparently don't have any help for her. It's receive a supernatural, impossible help from Jesus or, or perish. But she got it. Jesus bore impossible fruit. The doctors couldn't help her. Nobody could help her. She was beyond all human help. But Jesus, the, she was the also fruit from his ministry. And that fruit remains. The third one in that chapter is Jairus' daughter. Remember Jairus came? And at the time when he first came, his daughter was still alive. But before they even reached the house, the messengers came and said, well, your daughter's dead. Don't, don't bother Jesus anymore. And I know what Jesus, I love what Jesus said. He said, fear not. When soon, when Jesus heard them tell him that report that his daughter was dead, Jesus said, fear not, only believe. What if all of us had that attitude every single time? I don't care what hell throws at you. Jesus has not changed his mind. Fear not, only believe. Glory. I, man, I get a tingle down to my toes when I say that. That glory to God that makes me happy. <laughs> Fear not. Only believe. But see, that's the kind of fruit that we're supposed to be bearing. Yes, we're to grow in love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, temperance, meekness, faith. We, yeah, we're to grow in that more and more like him all the time. But we're also supposed to produce fruit. So that's always been the goal of the prayer center. It's still the goal of the prayer center, and we don't have any quitting sense. I don't care what hell throws at us. We have already heard from the master, fear not, only believe. That is precisely what we're going to do. Now, what there is, Jesus gave a sure fire way for you to make it impossible for you to ever bear any fruit. I don't know what we what he would call that message. How to never bear fruit. <laughs> if you do this, it will be impossible. The, he could say, this is the surefire way of remaining fruitless. All of those would be good titles. So, boy, when did Jesus ever teach a message like that? He taught it in Mark chapter 4. What? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to find it myself. If you've got a Bible or a phone, <laughs> turn over to Mark chapter 4. Alan has been teaching on this about maturity and, and, and everything. But see, at the near the end of Mark chapter 4, and this has been ignored, I think, way too much by the teachers in the body of Christ. I don't remember anybody ever uh, majoring on this when, they, when I have sat under teachers teaching on... Uh, the sower sows the word. Seriously, I, I have probably, I've heard probably well over a hundred, maybe, I don't know, several hundred messages in my 40 years being a Christian on the sower sows the word. And I, if they said it, I, I sure didn't really get it. They might have mentioned in passing um, what I'm about to tell you, but nobody focused on it. But now that I see it in the context, Jesus is saying, if you don't pay attention to this, you're never going to bear any fruit. If you keep being diverted all the time, you're never going to bear any fruit. Well, what is it, Gary? What is it that would prevent us from ever bearing any fruit? Well, it's a, verse 26 of Mark chapter 4. That he, he actually teaches this twice. 
when Jesus almost, like he repeats himself with the same lesson with two illustrations. It, it's really teaching the same thing, but he's like, okay, I'll teach it to you this way. I'll tell you the same thing a different way. And he does it, when he does that back to back, he is really trying to make a point here. So after he's taught the source of the word and, and, and he's explained it, even to his disciples privately, so they have a better understanding of it. And then he tells them, I'm going to put you up on a candlestick. This revelation is going to change the world. Everybody's going to see it. Then he tells them, it's sure far away now. If you violate this, it's a guarantee you'll never produce this fruit. Well, here it is. Mark 4, verse 26. And he said, so is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up. He knoweth not how, for the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. Now notice, first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. But now notice this, but when the fruit, when the what? When the fruit is brought forth, in other words, when it comes to fullness, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. What is he saying? You, you, there is no such thing as fruit without maturity. In the natural, we know this. Every fruit tree you've ever seen goes through seasons well, first, it goes through its first season. It's got to grow. My dad loved to plant uh, fruit trees. We had peach trees. We had, they didn't do real well. But we had peach trees. We had apple trees. We had pear trees. My dad would grow apple trees that would bear so much fruit, you'd have to put two by sixes and two by fours under the limbs to prop them up or they'd break off. I mean, it's amazing. And those trees produced apples every due season for 40 years. I mean, how many apples? Thousands of them, thousands of them. And, uh, but I remember when he first planted them. I, let's talk about the peach tree because I really had an experience with this little peach tree. He planted a little peach tree one time and it wasn't from a seed. He got a sapling. So the little, little wiry, you know, thin sapling, probably not even as tall as me, he planted it out there and, and of course, uh, you know, no fruit on it. And I remember uh, the first full year that it was there. I don't remember exactly how long it took. I don't remember it was a year or two. I don't really remember that. But I do remember the first time I ever saw a peach on it. And it wasn't a peach, you know, in Oklahoma, we have porter peaches. I mean, we have peaches that are so sweet. You'll bite into that thing and the juice run down both sides of your mouth. You'll swear somebody loaded it up with sugar. <laughs> Man, they're just sweet and juicy and good. And they're big, you know, they're like, they'll, they'll, one of them will fit, fit your hand pretty good. And, but I remember the first little peach that I remember appearing on my dad's peach tree. It wasn't, it wasn't any bigger than a large marble, maybe it's smaller than a golf ball. And, and I couldn't stand it. I had to go, but there were several of them on the tree. I got to try one because, you know, it was near the end of the season and it, it wasn't going to get any bigger. It's, uh, you know, and so I had to try it. So I went over and I plucked that little peach. I didn't want to get in trouble, you know, and I snuck around and I remember biting into that peach and I, I'm expecting this juicy, sweet, good stuff. That was the most sour, bitter thing I ever put in my mouth. Part of me goes, that can't be a peach, but it was a peach. What was wrong with it? Really, nothing was wrong with it. It just wasn't, this tree was not mature yet. And that's exactly what Jesus is teaching. See, Jesus says, the sower sows the word. What, ultimately, what, yes, yes. He, the sower sows the word. It could be the healing word. It could be deliverance word. It can be peace word. It can be all kinds of things. But see, ultimately, the gospel is God. He sowed Christ in you. When you got born again, God sowed the Word. <laughs> the Word who, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Well, eventually, Christ, the Word, was sown 
into you. You're the ground. We're all, each of us is the ground. And when we get born again, the word Christ, that his nature comes into us. But it comes in, Jesus said it comes in like this. It comes in like a seed. It, it's not the biggest thing in your garden. Now, according to Jesus, right after he says the sower sows the word, he said, you don't harvest until the fruit is mature. Doesn't that make sense? If you do, there's going to be no fruit, or it's going to be bitter fruit, or it's going to be imperfected fruit. Maturity is the key, and I didn't understand that for years. And I think I, I thank God Alan's been teaching on the same thing. Pastor Dave really taught on the same thing without exactly using these same words. But he was always teaching about getting past our strongholds and allowing the Holy Spirit to change how we think so that we, you know, Dave would say a lot of times, he says, you know, the only difference between you and a millionaire is the way you think. Well, yeah, you know what the difference between us and Christ is the way we think. But the Holy Spirit has been sent on purpose to transform us into the same image as Christ. I didn't look up the scripture, but you know the one that says, we behold his glory like in a mirror. It's a mirror. It's me, but I'm looking in a mirror, but I don't see me, I see Christ. Whoa. And Christ doesn't change. Christ is always full image. But as we behold him in this mirror, we are changed. into. If my Bible didn't say this, I would never believe it. We are changed into the same image, not something lesser, the same image, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. My goodness. Well, that makes so much sense to me. See, because I'll be honest, the world is always trying to get your attention. This is what Jesus was talking about, uh, the cares of this world. And listen, we all have to deal with stuff. This week, just this past week, uh, we had some storms in town and some big limbs came down on my mother's house. Well, my mother's 101. I have to, I have, who, who has to handle these things? I had to get in touch with tree trimmers and I had to talk to the insurance company. And we all have things we have to do. Mothers, you've got children to raise. Dads, you've got jobs. But now mothers have children and jobs, you know. And we're all busy. So that's one kind of distraction. And I'll tell you another kind in the church world. The church world is always trying to get you involved in some kind of program. I'm not against programs. We're supposed to clothe the naked and feed the hungry and those types of things. But listen, here you are. You're trying, you're trying to mature. Let me see. Good, I'm slowing down a little bit. I want to make sure I'm following him. <laughs> Just a moment. <laughs> okay. Because what I'm hearing, I'm hearing the voice of those prophecies that came in the blueprint to us. The blueprint from 2020. I am, you probably know what I'm talking about. All these, there was a set of prophecies, 10 of them, I believe. And we've had many subsequent prophecies right in line. If you boil that essence down, if you boil that, all those prophecies down to one essence, it was this. Come away with me. Come and spend time with me, says the Spirit of the Lord. Let me train you. Let me mold you. Let me teach you. Become intimate with me. Know my voice. What was, what's the purpose of that? Maturity. You can't, whoever you spend the most time with, that's who you become like. If you spend time with God, you're going to become more like God. And he's inviting all of us, not more... He almost, he almost begged us. He's entreating. I, come, come away with me. The wording reminds me so much of the Song of Solomon and, and the, the, the relationship between the husband and the bride there. And they were so enraptured with their love. Nothing else really mattered. Just to see each other again, to be in one another's presence. I love how Dave used to teach uh, <laughs> about nerd boy and nerd girl, you know, and See, I've always been a knowledge guy. I mean, I, I, I love good teaching about the Word. Uh, I love the Word of faith, learning uh, learning so much about the Word of God. And we should, uh, you know, study to show yourself approved, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. We should study. But Dave would say, you know, there's going to come a time in your walk where knowledge just isn't enough. And... Uh, 
he would talk about nerd boy. He said, man, I, I can't do it like Dave. Nobody can do it like Dave. But he said, if you can picture, he'd be like bedhead, uh, leaking pencil pack in his pocket, you know, and ink is leak, leak, you know, coming down. Got his, his shirt buttoned up with one button out of position. And knowledge, he's at the computer, knowledge. That's all I care about, give me knowledge. You know, Gary was much, very much like that in the early days. Man, I wanted to hear the next revelation. I want just knowledge, you know. And so, and that was okay for a season, knowledge. That satisfied him. He said, until the day that that company hired Nerd Girl. <laughs> and Dave would do so good. He'd, he'd say, Nerd Girl. He says, now she also had bed hair, bedhead hair, you know, uh, little, little glasses. Uh, her blouse buttoned with one button out of position. Had on a little skirt with a... Had, and I don't mean a little skirt, but had a skirt on, had uh, uh, two white socks, but one of them had a gold rim and the other one didn't. Walking down, first time he ever saw her, she's walking down the hallway with a green drink and she's going, nah, excuse me, knowledge, knowledge. <laughs> she's going down. <laughs> and, but Nerd Boy sees her and instantly, it's like, Cupid, draw back your bow. Remember Dave? Shoom. Right through my heart, he saw her. And he's going, knowledge, knowledge. And he sees her going down the hall. And he looks. And from that point on, knowledge was not enough to satisfy. From that point on, he had to be in the presence of who he loved. See, and that's where the Lord's been bringing us. Thank God for all of the knowledge we've learned. Thank, we're supposed to grow in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God for all the knowledge. But in these recent years, he's bringing us beyond knowledge into an intimate relationship with him. That is, I, again, I, I just thank Dave for that parable because it's absolutely the truth. Knowledge doesn't satisfy anymore. I've got to be in his presence. I've got to spend time with him. And even if I don't feel anything, and a lot of times I don't, I mean, I'd, I'm, I'm, I'm going, I'm learning more about worship and, and fasting. I'm working on those two limbs, trying to get the, trying to get more leveled up, you know. For years, I, I focused on the meditation of the word and praying in tongues, and I'm still doing those. But I almost did those to the exclusion, exclusion of fasting and worship. Well, got a little imbalance there. So now I'm focusing. I'm still doing, of course, the word and praying in tongues. But now I'm also adding much fasting and especially adding private worship. And most of the time it's still pretty dry. Uh, you know, so it's not based on how I, how I feel. I Every time I do, I, I call them kisses. Every now and then I get a, a kiss from the Lord. And uh, what I mean is there's just a wave of he's here. I don't know how else to put it. And they don't last. They haven't, none of them has lasted not even a minute, I don't think. But boy, when they come, I, I don't have words to exactly uh, tell you. You'll just, it's something that you have to experience. One time he did it driving the car. I, was le I left the neighborhood and I was going down the street. And just unexpectedly, he came in my car. I mean, <laughs> Lord, I'm driving. I don't want to kill anybody. <laughs> what I mean, when he comes, he comes. <laughs> and thank God it only lasted a few seconds. I called it a kiss. It's just, I'm, I want you to know, son, I'm with you. I want you to just be able to feel me just for a moment. And even though it was just for a moment, I, it's, it makes me more, worse than a cocaine addict. I, I've got to have it again. I've got to have it again. And I don't care the price. See, I think, God, excuse me. So look what it does to me. It wrecks me. And I've only had it a few, very few precious times. But it's, it's the most wonderful thing on earth. And how many times has he told us this is going to be a presence revival? His presence is going to come so strong. It won't be just a kiss. 
His presence is going to come in the buildings and in the meetings, not just here at the prayer center, but everywhere. All of you that have attached yourself and, and are doing this message, his presence is going to come. He said it's going to be difficult for people to walk. It's going to be difficult for them to enter and leave the building. But his pre just his presence will bring the miracles and the deliverance and the healings and the salvations. I, I can hardly wait. But right now we're in that process where he's saying, come and come away with me. Spend time with me. That is the maturing process. The seed in the ground. You think about a farmer, and then I come from a line of farmers on both sides of my family, and they plant the seed. They can't make the seed grow. The earth makes the seed grow, and God designed it all that way. Did you know modern man, with all of our technology, can still not produce a seed that will grow? And I mean, they have analyzed seeds six ways from Sunday. You know, they know the DNA, they know all of this and all of that, and they've done everything trying to, they can replicate a seed except for one thing. They can't make it grow. <laughs> they can't, they don't have the ability to impart life to it. But God has life in the seed. Oh my goodness. But the seed he planted in us has the full image of Christ. And it's there. But unless that seed is allowed to grow and mature and come to harvest, there never will be any fruit. And that's what he was saying there. Then he gives the second illustration. Second illustration. Um, verse Starting in verse 30, Mark chapter 4, verse 30. He's telling the same thing, just with a different illustration. And he said, Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which, when it is sown in the earth, is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, here we go again, it groweth up and becometh greater than all herbs and shoots out great branches so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. Well, he's teaching the same thing. He's, and he, of all the seeds he could have chosen, he purposely chose mustard seed. Many years ago, somebody sent me a, a mustard seed, the kind that they have in Israel. And it was in a little teardrop glass thing because, listen, that seed was so small, the only thing I could compare it to would be a grain of pepper. You know how small pepper is in your pepper shaker? Well, that's about the size of this seed. And... You know, in America, North America, when we grow mustard here, the mustard plant only gets about belt high. But I've seen pictures and documentaries of the mustard plant in Israel. It's different. And they grow to be what, it, it's like a tree. It's like 15 feet tall, which is what, two and a half times me, you know, almost. 15 feet tall, and it came What's the illustration? It came from that little pepper grain. What's he saying? The image in the seed is so much bigger than the seed itself. When you first get born again, it may seem like the smallest seed in your garden. But if you learn how to tend it. See, I, I said earlier, I come from a background of farmers. I, I've seen farming going on my whole life. Every time we'd go visit down in Shawnee or Seminole. Well, the farmer puts the seed in the ground, but he can't make it grow. What he has to do is what we call tend the seed. You got to keep it in the ground for one thing. You got to keep, you know, uh, wild animals from digging up the seed. You got to keep birds away from pecking up the seed. You got to uh, water the seed. Hopefully, if it's big crops, you you know you you, you got to trust God for rain. Man, I've been in prayer meetings for rain. <laughs> For in my farmer family, and God, he would send the rain. But you've got to tend the seed. But when the when the corn, let's talk about corn, for example, when that little corn plant puts that little blade up through the ground, is it harvest time? Good Lord, no, it's not near ready for harvest. You're just, you're just beginning. Well, first the blade, then the ear. Eventually that, that stalk will grow and there'll be little, little ears that start developing. Well, is it harvest time? Okay, let's go harvest. It's not harvest time yet. Even though there's ears on the on the stalk, it's not harvest time. You gotta wait until it's the full 
corn in the ear. Same with wheat, same with anything. It's not harvest time until the fruit has come to maturity. And that's, that's a, in both of these cases, that's what he's saying. Focus on maturing the seed. Focus on spending time with the Holy Spirit. Focus looking into that mirror, which is the Word of God, and allowing the Holy Spirit to transform you, change you, again, into that same image. That's hard for my religious brain to accept. Surely never, you don't mean the same, but that's what it says, change you into the same image. Oh my Lord, we focus on everything else. And you, so you'll start a season of prayer and fasting and worship in the word and, and it'll go along okay for a while. But first, then there'll come all kinds of outside distractions. Hey, a tree, limbs have fallen on your mother's house. <laughs> uh, you got to have open heart surgery. That was a recent thing with me. Uh, trust me, that will get your attention. <laughs> Can you tell I survived? He's just getting me revival ready. That's all. He's just getting us all revival ready. Anyway, but there's distractions. It could be persecutions. It could be afflictions. It could be all of those things externally. But I'm telling you, you got to watch out for internal things because people will always be trying to get you involved in their program. And I'm not against any program. It's again, it's fine. See, I'm going to focus. I'm going to talk about church growth for a moment. If, we've, if anything, we've been going through church non-growth. I mean, we. I feel like I'm sure all all of us feel like a Gideon in a certain extent. Hey, we started out with thirty thousand. I think it was. We started out with thirty thousand people. Now, <laughs> we're we don't have thirty thousand. How many? You know, no, we don't have ten thousand anymore. Uh, you got. 800? No, we don't have. I mean, it just keeps getting whittled down and whittled down and whittled down. And see, if if our goal was church growth, we know what to do. We know how to. We got. We know what kind of programs to put in place. We also know what to teach about finances to get money coming in. If that was the goal, but that's not the goal. The goal is maturity. The goal is fruit that remains. And I mean the kind of fruit that Jesus is talking about here. We do it all every week at Calling in the Lost. We make those confessions. Every, every kind of sickness, every kind of disease gets healed first time, every time, no exceptions. See, I, I, we, are, we are looking forward to having Jesus meetings, not just church. I am so tired, and I started to say I'm so tired of church meetings. Well, I'm really not. <laughs> Thank God we have church meetings. But we have a higher goal than that. And that's to have Jesus meetings. When I look at Jesus meetings, yes, he would teach. Yes, he would preach. But then he would heal the sick and cast out devils and do miracles. And I mean, not sporadically, but every single time. Can you imagine thousands? Of, I mean, his meetings were big. Can you imagine thousands upon thousands of people coming, bringing the sick and the halt and the lame and the blind? And it says, you know, I do that message that I do that service every now and then where I teach. I take five Jesus meetings out of the Gospel of Matthew, and I do it. I keep it in Matthew, so you know I'm not, you know, repeating, duplicating meetings by drawing the same meeting from another book. No, in the book of Matthew, and that, now I found more. But there's I teach this on a regular basis. There's five different services that Jesus did. We're, let's call it a Jesus meeting where it says he healed them all. He healed them all. Oh my goodness. See, and that continued in the book of Acts when they brought those people on the on the cots and, and the, the, when they brought the sick and the lame and the halt and they, they brought them and laid them on cots in the streets so that when Peter would pass by, let's say within shadow links, it wasn't the shadow that healed them, it was the proximity, the presence of God was emanating from Peter's body. I thank God it was Peter because we all relate with Peter. Peter made mistakes and God still used him. <laughs> we all have hope. <laughs> you know? Just Peter walking down through there and it says they all got healed and they brought them people from all these different cities around it. 
This is a Jesus meeting. This is where, where the first time, every time, no exceptions, they all got what they came for. Dear God, give us some Jesus meetings. Well, how is that fruit ever going to appear? It'll appear by maturity or it'll not appear at all. We've seen that now for ever since the book of Acts, for almost 2,000 years since. I thank God for every revival that's come. I thank God for every church that's preaching the cross and him crucified. I thank God for everybody who's feeding the hungry. Boy, if they're hungry and you're feeding them, God bless you. But somebody, and this is the calling that we've received, somebody has got to stay in the process of maturity until it's not just the blade, it's not just the ear, but it's the full corn in the ear. That's when the revival, that's when the outpouring and our portion in it will really happen. And it won't be a short-lived revival. Jesus has promised us the revival that we're going to have. Once it really breaks out in full, it's going to continue until Jesus returns. And there's going to be such a harvest in the earth. Let me talk about my beloved America. I'm not going to do politics, but I will tell you, I, I believe red, white, and blue. I love this country. <clears throat> the land of the free and the home of the brave, but this country little resembles the America I grew up in. It's turned so far from God, and there's people trying to pass laws, and they should pass laws that are righteous. But see, laws are not the answer. Government is not the answer. We've got to have a revival that changes the hearts of people. You can force people not to steal, but if they're a thief at heart, they'll steal if they get a chance. You can take that with everything, but if you change the heart, if they get born again, they truly, if we have a, a true, some people are calling it a third awakening, if we have a genuine not if we when we have this genuine revival that changes the hearts you won't you won't need to close down the bars the bars will close for lack of customers it's happened before it happened in wales during the welsh revival they literally had to close the bars no customers they had to close the the gambling halls and I heard that even some of the jails closed because there was nobody to arrest. Nobody was committing crime. Now, that's a revival, but it was short-lived. This revival, if we allow the fruit to come to maturity, a group of people that will not be moved by persecutions, afflictions, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches or the lust of other things, or will not even abandon the path of maturity to go to the streets and start trying to harvest prematurely. Listen, he told us plainly in Mark 4 how this works. And he says, if you want it for sure, never see any fruit. Just try and harvest before maturity because there'll be no fruit that way. Smith Wigglesworth, who was called the apostle of faith in his generation, he died, by the way, the same year I was born. I take that as a sign. <laughs> one of my heroes of the faith. I have, I have other ones, but Smith Wigglesworth, they would, this man's faith was astounding. You read some of the miracles that happened to him. He would pray for people and cancers would just fall off on the floor, right on the, right on the platform while people are watching. Uh, he prayed for one guy one time that had no leg and, and uh, he told him to go buy a pair of shoes. <laughs> He's in there to buy the pair of shoes and and the guy's going, what size? And they're looking down. And he said, doesn't matter. <laughs> as I remember the story, as he put that stump, tried to put his stump into the shoe, the legs grew out and feet fully formed. I can, that's a Jesus meeting there. Blind eyes open, several rays from the dead. They would ask Smith Wigglesworth, what is the secret of your faith? What is the secret? And he would always give them the same answer. First the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. 
In other words, you've got to let the fruit come to maturity. I'm going to say it a different way. Christ in you has to come to maturity. Maturity. Now, the, Alan teaches all the time, the nature comes in complete. It's, it's, your nature doesn't really change. But the new man on the inside, we could go to uh, Ephesians chapter 4, where it talks about the new man on the inside of you that is created in righteousness and true holiness. See, that's the part of us that is growing up. It's that new man on the inside. Peter said, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. Well, what does that tell you? It tells you we're not born again fully grown. We have we come in like babes. We have to be taught. We have to be matured. Thank God for the milk of the word. Thank God that we can grow thereby. But the, the, I want to emphasize again and again today the point of this lesson. I want to say it again. Jesus gave us an absolute sure way to never produce fruit. I'm not talking about necessarily you individually or me individually, although I am. But he's saying, really, church, church, I'll, I'll give you a surefire way to make sure you never, ever produce the fruit in the earth that I want produced. It's just try and harvest before maturity. It's all you got to do. Just go out and start trying to do it before there's maturity. Oh, sure, I know you're changing. I know you're growing. I know you're not like you used to be. You're... Maybe you're at blade length, you know, you're, that, that Christ has come up in you and first the blade. Well, you're at blade length. That's not harvest time. Well, no, I've been at it longer than that, and I've been praying and fasting and worshiping and in the Word. Well, maybe you're at the, the ear length. Maybe maybe little ears have appeared on you now, and, and you're, you're, it's growth. You're further along than you were before. But Jesus would say, no, it's not harvest time. Stay in there. Stay in there. Because what matters is the full corn in the ear. It has that new man has to grow up, has to come to maturity. Then he says, then, when it's fully mature, when you have grown up and matured, then it's time for the harvest. God is getting all of us revival ready. He's even getting our building revival ready. Let us cooperate with the Holy Spirit. I, I encourage you to listen to all of those prophecies going all the way back to uh, the blueprint in 2020, but all of the subsequent ones. Go over them again and again. By the way, if you don't have them, you need to get on the email list of the prayer center, and uh, uh, every time there's new ones, you'll get them. These are all reviewed by a bunch of 20 or so ministers. Anyway, I don't want to get into all that. I'm just saying if you want them, they're available. They're available right now at DaveRoberson.org. All of the ones that have come through the prayer center, you can go to BronkFlint.org, and I think BronkFlint.com, I'm not sure about that. But there's a section there where all of the prophecies are there. Jim Martin, uh, which is Grace Christian Center. Uh, go to their website. All of the prophecies are there. But I encourage you, listen to them. It's God talking to us. It's God giving us his instructions. And at this point, the instructions, even though they're modified a little bit, the, the, if you're going to boil it down, he's still saying, come away with me. Spend time in intimately with me. Let me teach you. Right now I'm hearing a, a recent one. There is no pattern. There is nobody in the earth that we could go to right now. There is no there is no ministry producing this on a regular basis. Thank God there's ministries where the gifts are there. But there's nowhere we can go. There's nobody on earth right now that's operating in this. If there was, we're not proud. We'd go sit at their feet and be taught by them. But there isn't one right now. There's only one person that can get us there, and his name is the Holy Spirit. And he's the teacher that Jesus said would guide us into all truth. So I'm still scheduling my time i want to make sure that I'm, I'm in worship i'm in the word i'm in some fasting but i am in prayer because i know and i of course i pray in english some but see there's only one that has the knowledge there's only one that can really get us there and thank god for the teacher god gave us and it's good it's good. he's also god he's god the holy spirit thank god that we have the ability to pray in other tongues thank God, 
at Jim Martin's uh, conference that they had up in Dayton this year, there were so many wonderful things said, and I don't want to diminish any of them. They were all great. But when I was listening to them, one sentence just pierced my heart. And it, I think it came through Jamie Legault. But she said, "Fall in." the Spirit is saying, fall in love with tongues all over again. Fall in love with tongues all over again. All over again. Well, why? He's the one that matures the fruit. He's the one that helps grow up the image. Dave would say it like this. It's like our, our new man, uh, the inner man. It's time to go to the classroom. And we sit there, we, we sit down in our seat. And then finally the man walks in and he says, the finely dressed gentleman at the chalkboard, his name is the Holy Ghost. And he's the one that's been sent to teach us and to guide us. I'm going to say for today's lesson, he's the one that's been sent to mature the fruit, to grow up that new man on the inside of us to where we are the full corn in the year. That's when you put in the harvest. I hope you enjoyed today's lesson. We'll see what next week looks like. <laughs> he's getting us all revival ready. And revival is now. See you next time in Jesus' name. Amen.